Hi, everyone. And today is a very interesting session to talk about prompt engineering. So, you know, prompt engineering wasn't a term until recently when large language models were popular, like ChatGPT brought about a lot of new jobs and prompt engineering is one of them. So what exactly is prompt engineering? Um, it is basically to program the, or rather to type the prompt to the large language model in such a way that you get consistent and reliable output. So there have been some tips and tricks being shared around social media and so on. Over here, this is a set of uh, tips compiled by myself um, that I, I got some insights after I programmed it to, to program my lawyer game, to program the Harry, Harry Potter RPG game, as well as some other applications that involves like question answering. So, so there's some actually some things that you can do to make the output more reliable. And here we shall talk, talk about some of them. So this is the aim for today, as mentioned earlier. Okay, so before I begin about talking about prompting, let's just review some of the differences between like large language models like ChatGPT on the left, as well as computer programs on the right. So the main thing that you can see here is that we have on the left a program like a large language model that is very, very dynamic, very, very adaptable. So I think most of y'all, if you played around with GPT, you realize that you can actually get it to do a lot of things. It can be like a tour guide, it can be a financial accountant, it can be a classification machine to classify contacts or classify sentiments. You just need to prompt it and it can do the job. So this is quite remarkable. Okay, now imagine this. Okay. How many of you here think you can do like sentiment analysis using programming? Like with this traditional, like maybe Python program to take in a word, use some NP trees and get sentiment analysis out. Do, do you all think this is easy? Okay, so the answer is actually not very easy because people have done this for years. Okay, actually, ChatGPT is a form of sentiment analysis machine as well. It was initially created as a large language model, but soon as the scale progresses, it could do a lot more things other than just natural language processing. It can do like, intent processing. So this is the third point, actually. So intent processing is one of the key features of large language models like ChatGPT. So the, the way I'm define intent processing is like this. If you want the GPT to do a certain job, you just need to tell it what's like its purpose in life. Or like imagine like if, if, if you are born and then someone tells you your purpose in life is to count the number of ones in the sentence or something like that. So, so if you tell something like that, GPT is able to interpret the sentence in a semantically meaningful way provided you use English words that have been trained in their training distribution, uh, the, the tokens as well. Yeah, so if you can do that, ChatGPT is able to operate largely out of the box and can even do for cases whereby I'm very, very sure in the internet you've never seen before. Like, I guess the lawyer game is one example. <laughs> like, I, I don't think people have done a text-based game where, you know, you, you role play as a lawyer. Okay, I, I may be wrong. But other people have also tried to get it to like draw phoenixes in like LaTeX. Uh, this is actually done in the, there's one paper that talks about it. It's talking about the, something like the AGI, uh, first step to AGI. I can't remember the paper's name, but this one was quite a popular paper. Okay, but how GPT-4 is able to do things that like, I think it's called the, the Sparks of AGI paper. Yes, that's, that's the paper. Yeah. So you can see that even out of distribution cases, as long as the words have some semantic meaning, by the nature of the self-attention mechanism, they are able to mix and match and form that semantic meaning. And so it's very, very powerful at doing this intent processing. Okay, but what are some of the drawbacks? Some of the drawbacks for large language models are that it may not be replicable. So as you have experimented before, if you use the same prompt and you keep generating again and again, you will get different responses. Unless, okay, there's a caveat for this, unless you prompt it very, very specific things. Like the more specific you get, the more replicable your output is. So if you prompt like, generate me only in yes or no, then you give a very, very long context and then ask a question, the answer most of the time would be the same, okay? But if you give it very generic kind of questions like, 
what is the answer for this question? That you don't condition that, okay, it must be yes or no. It can give you blurbs of responses that although might be similar in, in the semantics, but the phrasing and everything can be different. So this, this may be a problem for some applications. It may not be replicable. Whereas if you use computer programs, you are quite guaranteed to get the output you desire because you actually code it in. Uh, if you ask it to print hello world, hello world will come out. Okay, there's no question about that. Hello world will come out unless you do a, a syntax error or something that leads to the program not being able to compile. Other than that, whatever you program in is guaranteed to come out. Uh, any, any questions so far for this slide? Okay, so the next part that I'm going to talk about is more like how you can use both of them, right? So for large language models, although they are very versatile, they actually take very long to process your query. Okay, so this very long is subjective. Okay, because uh, actually a computer program, if you do like multiple for loops stacked together, uh, you could also incur runtimes that are quite long. And that runtime might be even longer than, than this recursive token generation. So like an example of recursive token generation is like this. So if you want it to generate like Mary had a something, then you need to let it generate the first token first, little, and then. Yeah, so in this case, you need to generate like token by token like that. Which means that you, if you want to generate like N tokens, you need to wait for N iterations of this cycle. Okay, of course, um, there have been ways to like get it to run faster. You, you know, like each single cycle of generating one token. Okay, initially the runtime by the attention mechanism is about O N squared, where N is the number of tokens at, uh, in the context. Okay, but with flash attention, we can get it down to like, oops, yeah. Okay. With, with advances such as like flash attention, you can actually get it down to non-quadratic. I think it's in uh, n log n kind of timing with flash attention. So this is something that could help to speed up like large language models. And with more research, we can actually get this to generate even faster. Okay, but for this on the right here, it's, it's more or less fixed unless you have new algorithms. So this really depends on use case for the runtime wise. Uh, the second one is actually a big problem. <laughs> so like when I'm trying to use this for the like the up challenge, uh, one of the constraints uh, up is the abstraction and reasoning corpus challenge. I'm trying to solve it using large language models. Okay, but the main problem is that every inference you use with GPT-4 or like chat GPT, you will, will need some money for the tokens. The last I checked was like two cents every 1,000 tokens. So that can easily like sum up a lot, especially if you do recursive generation, like auto GPT that keeps generating in a recursive way. Like you split your goals into sub goals, then you do your sub goals, then you split the tasks and so on. Yeah, so all this um, requires a lot of money. Uh, if you use computer programs, it's free to use, right? There's also another thing. If you use open source here, okay, it may be free. So if you use like Alpaca, Ikuna, okay, but this, this might be non-commercializable. So, so there, there's pros and cons for, for this. Okay, but um, based on what my experience with all this, these are still inferior to chat GPT. Maybe I ask like, sorry, do you think the open source are uh, good, good enough to compete with chat GPT? Actually, I, I just saw a paper came out like just a few days ago from Berkeley. Uh, it's led by some very prominent figures. That the, the paper claimed that the uh, open source uh, LLM, right? They just, they are only able to mimic the proprietary LLM like ChatGPT, just a uh, very superficial level. So uh, it can be deceptive to some, like to human evaluators. But I think I haven't read the entire thing, but like, from what I saw from the extract, the, they, they come out with some other ways to do evaluation and uh, the open source one actually fell off quite 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 a lot. So there might be more caveat of using open source. Uh, okay. On top of that, I think also tried the open assistant, right? So another caveat is like all your prom is like uh, uh, available to be seen by everyone. So I think that's another thing. How to commercialize your personal data in mind. 
Yeah, this one is uh, information uh, security here. It's, it's one of the big points also. Like I have a project that uses, uh, like tries to interpret like some medical data sets with large language models. Um, that, that is a problem because of rather if I call it information privacy, not security, privacy. Because if you use large language models, as you say, people might get your prompts. Like I'm very sure ChatGPT gets everyone's prompts. Uh, OpenAI gets everyone's prompts. It's just whether they are using it for their training or using it for other purposes. Uh, OpenAI existent, probably your prompts are used for training. So I, I think they are quite transparent about that. Yeah, so that is um, some of the limitations with, with using this kind of like models it, is that you may not want to use it if your data is sensitive. So most people, they just generate their own large language models from scratch. However, that is uh, quite, quite a bad strategy because this kind of large language models like ChatGPT, they, train, they are trained on a wide corpus of data. And to replicate that, you you probably need quite a huge sum of money, like a few million dollars, if you want to train to that extent. Okay, but of course you can use you can train less and spend less. Yeah, but the general idea is that if you use like a trained model that is already quite extensively trained, it probably costs money per, per per use and can also infringe on some privacy issues. So this is something that um people might want to take note. So like in very sensitive applications, it might be better to like not use large language models. I, actually, there's a, there's a pipeline that I've seen, okay, where you anonymize your data and then you fit into the large language model. Then when it comes out, you can re, like you can use a lookup table to like, for, for example, name, like John can be mapped to entity one or person one, and then you can reverse mapping back. So something like this could help to bypass, uh, although it is also possible to just base on like entity one, entity two, entity three, you can deduce some relations if you are smart enough. So this is not a foolproof method. Okay, but I would say the money is one of the biggest uh, deterring factors because if you want to use this like for your application, this would incur quite a huge cost. Like especially if you are doing like chatbots or every single prompt that the user use, uh, types into your chatbot, you need to pay the money for them or, or they need to pay it with their, uh, with their API key. Right, the last point is about flexibility. Uh, this is where large language, mod large language models shine, all right? Large language models are very, very flexible. They can accept multiple input formats in multiple languages. You can try it. You type English and then suddenly change to Chinese or Japanese or Malay, and GPT can still understand. So this is something that is much, much better than computer programs because computer programs, if you like programming in English, if you speak in Chinese, it's not going to understand it, okay? Because it's not explicitly told how to interpret it. But here, even ChatGPT, even if you do typos, it can still accept it, right? The, the most like striking use case is like if you want to do in terms of dates, right? You know, there's a lot of formats for dates like month, year, month, year, day, day, year, month. You throw any kind of format in ChatGPT, you can still interpret it. You can even say stuff like you know two days after May 5. Then it can help you do to map, map it to May 7. Yeah, so it's very versatile. Okay, so this is something that a computer program, if you try to do it in a computer program, it will be very, very painful because there's so many different possibilities that could happen. And this is most naturally done using large language models like semantic like mapping. So you can map this into semantics two days after May 5, you know, then you can go into a related um, a related format as what you want. You can even specify the format, like display in the following format. Then you can type months, day, year. You, you can just type this as a prompt in the large language model and you can do whatever input you want and you can get this out. You can try it. Yeah, this is quite versatile. This is all in the large language model part, by the way. Yeah, so this is something that traditional computer programs cannot really do. Okay, I mean, last time there was a programming challenge where you are supposed to take in various day, month, year formats and output in the same format. Uh, that is like the third or fourth question of some uh, Olympiad of informatics. Is, is that difficult? Because there's so many different possibilities that you can do. Okay, so with this, in mind, all right, with this flexibility in mind and also taking into account all the like 
all the stuff like it may not be replicable, that kind of thing. Let us see how we can better prompt our large language models to perform the tasks we want it to do. Okay, and also we assume we have infinite money, all right, because right now it costs money to use. So this is the key benefit again, flexible and perform most tasks out of the box without any pre-training or programming. Okay, you can just type in what you want. So there's this person called Andre Karpati. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he did say that um, English is the new programming language. And that is because you can prompt large language models very versatilely and it can react pretty well, decently well in most situations. Right. And if you know how to prompt it well, if you are specific in your prompt, you can get reliable and consistent outputs for most cases. Okay, let me just do a caveat here. It is not very good at logic. So I tried to program it to do like a mind sweeper game where you know your number needs to reflect the number of minds on, uh, around it. Uh, it just can't, doesn't do that that well. Uh, it's not organic to the word embedding space to do like logic operations. So for stuff like that, maybe you need a computer program. Okay, so let's uh, go through like what I think is the future of large language models. So I think the future of large language models will be more of a systems level approach because a single program, right, is limited like by the prompt length, it's limited by like the amount of um, intention you can encode into one program. Because if you want it to do like everything that a human brain can do, you know, one program is not going to cut it. Okay. Rather, we need to compose it into various programs. Okay, let's take for instance, you want a program that can generate music. So maybe this program can like be do for country country style music. And the other program can be like rock style and the last okay let me use a different color and last program maybe is like classical style okay this is a bad color let me change the color the last program can be something like classic classical style okay so you you can have programs to do that and then your meta level program could be something like you want to get it to do like condition it on the kind of beat so maybe this is a fast pace and the second one will be like slow pace or something. And so you can have a, a each program specializing in a certain style of a certain intention, and then you can get them to interact with each other. Like the top level programs can choose the kind of like sub blocks that you want it to, to utilize. And then these sub blocks will then feed back to the meta program. And not just that, between programs, they can actually talk to each other. Between programs, they can interact with one another. And then they, they can let each other know, okay, these are the stuff I've done. What are the stuff you've done? So you can actually communicate with one another. And this actually is something like group, group intelligence. Like each person is specialized in something. But through the interactions of each other, you can get intelligence that is beyond the sum of its parts. So there's some form of emergence okay maybe there will be emergence if you do something like this a systems level approach so um, this kind of approach in uh, Andre Karpati works is called LLM ops right which I think will be one of the key things in the future because there's really a lot of things you can do with this kind of LLM ops and like the stuff that I'm creating for the art challenge is also part of this like you are getting systems of LLMs to communicate with one another some of these systems might even be memory know to like reference the database and so on you you can even get apis to interface with it so the program itself may not be an lm the program itself might be external tools that you you interface with it so these are very very versatile stuff so on the right you can on, on the base here you can see it's very highly parallel you have different specializations or it could be even the same program run multiple times just to get stochasticity and at this level you get hierarchical so basically, you use the top-level programs to ask the bottom-level programs to run tasks. So this kind of um, things will be quite influential in the future. Uh, any questions on this? OK, so one of the examples for this is something like Baby AGI. Or this is actually similar to like how AutoGPT does it. But this is a very, very simplified uh, way. And I like this code because this whole thing runs in one Python it runs in one Jupyter notebook. So if you want to find out more about this, uh, like auto GPT style, I recommend Baby AGI because it's one of the easiest to understand. All right. So you use this, okay, 
GPT-4 in multiple agents. One agent creates the task, one agent executes the task, and one agent prioritizes the task. And guess what? Each of these agents are actually the same GPT model prompted differently. So it's like, you know, the same, same, but different, you know? Everything is just a GPT model. You just need to say the prompt. You just change the prompt. Like the create task, you can say you are a task creation agent. Your aim is to insert aim here. Your aim is to create the task here. Your input is this. You are to output the list of tasks. Some... Okay, so you can you can just create something like that. And you can do the same thing for the execution task agent and the prioritization task agent. You can specify the input and outputs you want from it. And instantly, this will be an executable block over here. Like this create agent here, task creation agent is done. All right? In the actual code, is only three or four sentences for each agent for the baby AGI. And that, that is how powerful GPT is. Okay? You can just use different prompts to then like, get different agents and you can interface these agents together. So you, you can see over here, the first step of Baby AGI is that the user will create a task. Okay, the user will define the task. And then what we will have is we will get the first task, which is often defined by the user, like maybe your goal here. Maybe it's like create a web page on cooking. So then this will check, okay, on the like you, you can actually have. Even over here, there's also a context agent, which helps to, okay, they didn't use this in the baby AGI code, but I suspect this context agent is just to align like whatever um, goals you have with the existing like context of what you have done. And then you can like feedback the task in the same format. Okay, but let's assume we don't have this context agent. We just have the execution agent to decide what it wants to do. All right. And then you can then store like, What's the task input? What's the task? What was the task? And then like what, what are the task outputs? You can store this in the vector database and you can use this vector database okay, to, to actually like refine the context later on over here. The main thing that you see here is like something like create a web page on cooking can be given to a task creation agent and then the, the subtask can be formed. So the sub goals can be create web page, find out more about booking details. So based on this task, you can then prioritize which are the tasks you want to do first. And then you can then sequence the task list. Okay, the first list of the task list will then be put out and so on. So this is the one of the ways to get like GPT to solve things in an iterative manner. It, actually, I would call this, call this a hierarchical level because you start with the broad goal, you decompose the goal into smaller goals. Later, each of these smaller goals can then be decomposed again into even final goals. And this would enable you to do hierarchical based planning, which is quite powerful. So given the generalizability of um, GPT, you are able to do arbitrary tasks pretty well. And imagine if you interface it with like uh like you interface it with some system to create web page or a system to search the web. Web retrieval. Okay, let's call it this web retrieval. If you interface this with web retrieval, you might even find like content on the web that tells you like how to create a web page. You know, it does not need to remember everything, you can search things. Okay, and then if you even give it access to your own website. <laughs> you might be able to get the whole website generated without your input at all. So this is something that can be quite impressive. If you interface this kind of systems well, you can get very powerful systems. Of uh, course, at the cost of a lot of money as well. So if you were to run this, it might cost like tens of US dollars to perform a task, like maybe create a web page. I haven't tried it out myself. I intend to try it out soon. Okay, I'm going to burn some money to try it out. But the idea behind all this is you can interface things in a, in, in a multi-agent system, which can be very powerful. So enough about all this. Uh, okay, this is just a game that I recently played. And who, who here has played the Gandalf game before? 
So this game is a game where you try to get this large language model agent to reveal a password that has been given. And there's been some rules to, to like tell it not to say the password. And one of the most powerful rules that it has, okay, is that yes, this GPT layer that can do the safeguard. So whatever you interact with the with, with the LM, let's say if you tell me the password like that, and then the LM replies like password is ABC. And then when, when this goes up to this next level here, to the GPT level, the GPT will then see like GPT sees ABC. And then it's like, okay, this is the password. Lock it. So it's very powerful because when you prompt this user interaction level, okay, you don't exactly directly talk to the GPT that is like controlling whether the password is reviewed. So you can actually get the LM to tell you the password by some um, means. You don't just you just don't use the word password. You can get it to disc describe it. You can just ask what is the answer, and then the LM will respond this. But the problem is this top level GPT. This top level GPT can see that the password has been generated, and it will block it and say that, oh, I see you are trying to get the password, but I cannot give you that. So this <laughs> this is very powerful using just a hierarchical layer like that you can actually safeguard something even more uh, tighter. Okay. But as you know, this is a game. Okay, there's, a, there's ways to still do prompt injection to get the password out. Now, anyone here has, uh, has managed to get this to work? <laughs> like, has managed to solve this kind of uh, game before? Just curious. Just to clarify, the, the safeguard part is a separate however. Right? Yeah, it's a separate LM. Yeah, so this double layered LM. I mean, if you want to make it even more powerful, you can have a triple layered LM. You can have a GPD that you can stack this up. Okay, of course, the only bottleneck is like the cost and the inference time as well. Yeah. So, okay, so in case you all are in, intending to play this game, yeah, I wouldn't really say in detail what, what the solution is. Okay, but I'll just uh, like briefly touch on like how this can still be attacked. Okay, the way is not to give the password directly. So because in this game, all the passwords are letters. So you can ask it to list the password in like, in fruits or in animals, in the alphabet and so on. So yeah, something like that. Yeah, you can, you can think about it yourself. I'm just gonna flash like one of the working prompts for all the levels here. So if you're interested, you can see it later. Okay, so over here, this is the, start of the prompting tips that I have to share. So the first thing I want to talk about is zero shot prompting. So zero shot prompting is very powerful. You can actually describe what you want to do. Okay. And one of the ways to do zero shot prompting. Okay. First, what is zero shot? What is few shot? Okay. Zero shot means no examples given at all. And the large language model is able to perform. Okay. Few shot means you give it few examples. Okay. When can you use zero shot prompting? is when you can describe what you want to do or describe the categories for classification. So one way I've experimented, experimented with it is like this. I just say that like you are to classify stuff. So I give it a purpose in life. Okay, you are to classify the context of each sentence. And then this is what is given as, like these are the context given as this, right? So that it knows that, you know, this is the format. Okay, this is another hack. Okay, if you want it to like do formatting, you do you use these curly brackets because they use this a lot in JSON. They are quite familiar with like anything in the bracket is like one segment. So you can use this to do formatting, these curly brackets. Very, very powerful. Okay, you you can also use other brackets, I guess, like round brackets, but these curly brackets work the best. <laughs> All right. So it is because it's used in JSON rep representation and it's used a lot in HTML pages, which have been scraped. Um, to a large extent for this kind of LM systems. Okay, so over here we have this context letter A, and then we have the description. So these are the descriptions of the various contexts I want the large language model to classify. So it's either mountain, classroom, or garden. So what I do is I be very specific in telling it what I want it as output. So classify the following and give the answer as number context letter. Okay, so the answer here would become like that one A. 2, B, 3, C. Okay, so 
I also specify here, only provide the context letter without the description. Okay, this is because I don't want it to give me like, sometimes GPT will uh, go on and on like, oh, this is on a mountain which contains like steep slopes and, and describe why this answer is, is correct. I don't want it to do that. So when you are doing this kind of thing for your applications, you want very concise answers that will directly link to what you are interested in. So if you do this kind of curly brackets to constrain your input and your output, this is actually very powerful because you can get quite consistent outputs using this, right? I, I tried it with a variety of um, different use cases and this kind of works most of the time, right? So this is the, like you can, you can then do multiple queries at the same time. Okay, why do we do multiple queries at the same time? Because of money, <laughs> because every thousand tokens is two cents, right? So you want to maximize the number of tokens you send there. So you send to the API this number of tokens, you use check completion API, and out comes back this kind of um, categories like that. You can, you can basically do classification for like hundreds of input samples using 1,000 tokens, okay, depending on how, how much uh, background you need to write here. So this, I don't even give it any example. I don't even say, oh, this is a steep slope, means it's on a mountain. Oh, this is an eraser, means classroom. I don't give it any example at all. This is just purely describing my categories and and it works quite well, very well actually. Yeah, so when this happened, I was pretty amazed because this is like entirely uh, described by myself. I mean, I also did this for like my games sometimes. Like ask it to basically generate things related to this category. And it does so zero shot without like even giving it any examples. So yeah, I, I, found, I found this quite cool. Do you have anything you want to ask regarding this? Okay, if not, let's move on. All right, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is like what, uh, why classification is so powerful. So if you all have seen this paper before, this is a paper about agents talking to each other, 25 agents in the sandbox, all right? And what, um, they are, what I'm going to focus on is here, the large language model, when it's trying to rate how important a memory is to answer a certain question, like what are you looking forward to most right now? It has three categories. One is the timestamp, which is like recency, timestamp of when the memory was accessed or formed, all right? And then it also has relevance, which is like vector embedding, which uses some open AI vector embeddings to see how similar the memory is. Like the memory can be something like refrigerated though is idle. How important this memory is to the question. So you can use some vector similarity, some cosine similarity of two different, uh, of, of two vectors. Okay, but this importance part is, using the large language model to rate itself, like how important is this memory to you? And in the paper, this is what um, they did. They did this on a scale of one to 10, all right? Where one is purely mundane and 10 is extremely poignant. Rate the poignancy of this memory. So over here, I gave it the memory, like breakup in a relationship. So you can see that a breakup is considered 10, right? and you would expect the large language model to classify it as 10, All right? But if you look at ChatGPT, it classifies it as eight or nine only, All right? This shows that if you do an ordinal scale, sometimes the ChatGPT may not be able to get you the right classification or right answer. So like, it's better to use this kind of zero shot classification rather than the one on the left. You can just give like different classes, boring or mundane for class one, requires some concentration, but it's not noble for class two, some concentration and it's noble class three, class four is happy and class five is sad or fearful. So this in order of um, importance, this is my own categorization, some arbitrary categor categorization. And this basically helps to rank the memories from like most important. So the most important is at the bottom. Yeah and the least importance at the top. So you can see that a breakup will be classified as set or fearful, which is, which is exactly what we want, right? So something like this, just knowing how to prompt the zero shot classification in this kind of categories, okay? Use categories, use discrete categories rather than continuous uh, values. This generally works better for large language model prompting. 
Okay, next, few short prompting. So few short prompting is when we have some examples given. And over here, we have some number classifier. And over, what, what I want it to do is, I want it to do whether uh, it's odd or even. Okay, but I don't specify, don't specify the, the task. So yeah, number classifier, you only specify like, Okay, of course, this um, is quite arbitrary. Sometimes when we want to do this few short prompting, we also specify the task as well. Okay, and then this input output is just to consolidate, make, make the model like more attuned to the task. But over here, I just do the very, very naive method where I just do the few short prompting without even specifying what task it is. I mean, I say I'm a number classifier, but I don't specify like what's the categories or maybe don't specify the categories. Over here, you see three is odd, four is even. Then I ask it, what is the classification of the number? Six, and it gives me the right answer. It gives me as even. Yeah, and one of the benefits of few-shot prompting I've tested is quite robust to noise. So imagine if you have a few more inputs here. You have input three is like five, and output three is odd. Then you have input four is seven, and output four is even. Okay, if you have something like that, right, provided you have more um, proper inputs than noise, you can actually get this to, when you ask it to classify number seven, you can actually get the output of odd. So using this method to do classification might even give you better results than your original data itself because it's able to link categories that are similar together. Okay, of course, over here, the model probably already know, knows what's odd and even. You can replace these categories with A or B to make it harder, make, make a harder task for the large language model. But it's still able to do that. And it's also robust to noise. I tested it out. So I did odd even classifications with categories A and B, and it can still do this kind of thing. Provided you have more samples that are correct than wrong, it's pretty robust to the noise. Okay. Now let me know if you want to ask anything. If not, I'm just going to move on. Yeah, yeah. I have one comment here. Okay, so I, I've, I've seen an article talk about this uh, few short prompting, or I think they call it context learning. So, so one thing that is quite, I think, impressive is that even though if you try to give it, a, you give it an example, even you give it the wrong example, so long as it's the, the formatting is correct, it still can give you the correct classification. Meaning that in your example, you if you even you purposely you put the wrong the, the, the object in the wrong category, it still can give you a correct. So yeah. it doesn't it doesn't just learn the it doesn't really it, it's not like it's just trying to find the exact pattern from your from it actually it's using the format to kind of locate the knowledge it learned in its own model. So so to just to uh just to see the format, the, the kind of format you want, but the knowledge itself is not from your example. Yeah, I saw. Yeah. yeah. So I, you I, are saying I, that I saw, the yeah. example is totally wrong input and output meaning, but it can replicate the format only without following the meaning. No, it knows it's wrong example. Ah, but, yeah. but it still can uh, give you the correct classification. That's because, because you it, correct the task, you, right? You, yeah, you, know, you have to give like the specify the task itself. Then you give the example, but you give the wrong example, but it still can give you the correct classification. I didn't try it myself. I just saw it from some article. Yeah. I can give it a try. I, I, I fully agree with this. So actually, um, this few-shot prompting is also used in the OpenAI API of plugins. Or, you know, if you, you remember the thing that I talked about last time, Visual Chat GPT, they also do something like that. They have the full name, who name maybe this is a uh, let's talk about visual QA. Who description is like used to ask a question to an image in order to find out more information. Then you can also put like example input output. Yeah, you can just specify the format like the input will be like the the the, the question is this, and the answer is this. Yeah, so you can give this and then you can also give like the 
use cases. I, I guess if if you want to know like for images, or you can put like uh what do you call that input type, input format images. Yeah. So you, you can do something like that in order to constrain like how you use the tool. All right. And this is an example of you shot prompting because okay, if we just look at the tool description here. Okay, the tool description here is, is just zero shot. There's no examples. But once you give the examples here as well, this will become few shot prompting. And the few shot prompting is, is quite good because it helps you to like consolidate how exactly you want like maybe your input output format to be. And also it can help you ground the model in some context, especially if your description is ambiguous. And lastly, if you have this input format thing at the bottom, the format thing constraints potential inputs, outputs. Because sometimes there's a lot of different things that you can use like a certain program on. You can even say like, oh, this program is used for this kind of inputs and this kind of outputs. Yeah, this just describing verbally what this input format is can already help to improve the performance a lot because the model knows, okay, what are the kind of things that it should process, what, what it should not. So it's like every time when you write a function, in Python, you like describe in text what the function is. You know, um, stuff like Copilot actually can take this and generate your whole function out. And like GitHub Copilot can actually do that. And you can also specify, like if you specify more and more specific stuff, like the input format, output format, they can actually use this to know what kind of function you want. All right, this is quite powerful. This is actually, in my opinion, this called constraining or filtering which helps to like narrow the path of possible generations, All right? And um, so if you can do something like that, you can make more and more consistent and reliable outputs by constraining. So this is one tip I have again, constraining the output by specifying more clearly what your intention is. Okay, and also like you can also explicitly constrain output types. Yeah, this is very powerful. If you can do this, you can make the output only apply for like, or, or you can make the input only apply for certain uh, types like images. Okay, here's also input and also constraint input type also. And you can make the generation more plausible and more consistent to what you really want. So you can try it. Yeah, the more vague you are with your problem, the worse the outcome will be. Okay, because GPT can they call it hallucinate or confabulate and can come out with things that are like very, very stochastic and random. But the more you constrain through prompting, okay, few short prompting is a way of constraining your output. Okay, the more you constrain your output, the more reliable and consistent your output will be. Okay, if there's nothing else, I'll, I'll move on. All right, so all these last uh, examples that I've shown, have a simple format, right? Which is intense, right? So you realize the few shot and zero shot prompting is all the same. You are a purpose in life. So like you are a calculator. You are a financial assistant. You are a salesperson. Yeah, you know, you can just define that. Now if people ask me like, okay, I'm gonna create a sales bot, but my sales bot is not very persuasive. Then I say, do you specify how you want it to talk to the client? Then, I, I, then they say, oh yeah, I didn't specify it. And I say, oh, you must be very specific what you want it to do. I want it to respond enthusiastically to the sales deal. I want it to be, uh, the salesperson must be uh, ready to offer assistance or must be amicable, friendly to the user, but firm when establishing a deal. So if you describe all this in detail about the characteristics, GPT will try its best to follow it. So the more specific you, the more specific you, pro you prompt this, the more reliable the generation. Okay. So then you can put in your example format, your input output is like few shot learning. Then you can like ask it to program. Like you can give inputs. These are the inputs. And then you can ask it like, what is the output? You can either say, what is the output? Or you can just put like output. Yes. So this is when you want to do like classification tasks, you can get it to generate like that. Right, this is uh, how we program intent. You just put you are purpose in life. That's it. 
All right, so I face issues uh, where I cannot use the word you, all right, because sometimes in the game, when you want to prompt the player very exactly, okay, I want to the LM to prompt the player, what is your input, all right? <laughs> and then, you know, if you put you are something, right, the LM is going to think that your refers to you, okay? So we want to break this link. We don't want the LM, we are using you in the game, we don't want the LM to think that U is itself. So we give it a third party designator. And this third party designator can be the LM. So that's impressive. You know, if you just say the LM or the language model, or you can say GPT 4 is this, it somehow knows its identity. So that's quite interesting. Yeah, you can even do something like that. Wait, wait. I, but yeah. I thought like it cannot recognize itself as GPT 4. I tried before, it says it's GPT 3.5, even, okay. even though it's GPT 4. So oh, then maybe the metadata that OpenAI gives it is not uh, updated. So maybe just use the LM that uh, if you have experience that you use GPT-4 and that doesn't work, then use LM because this DLM prompt works for both ChatGPT and GPT-4. I tried it for the lawyer game. So yeah, use the LM then. Okay, so that's it for this slide. All right, so this is about consistent output. Um, as what I mentioned earlier, the more you condition it, okay, the more consistent it is. Right? The other way to do it is to do it in a fixed format for the input and output. Okay, input output, you can do it a few short uh, learning and then give it a fixed format, then it can give you that same format back. You can also you do the input and output in a JSON format. Right? Then it will be very consistent because it will follow the JSON specifications. Right? One other thing that I didn't write here, you can also do retrieval augmented generation. So you can give it like context one, context two, and then you can ask like the prompt over here. So something like, if you want to ask like, what is the author of this book? Uh, maybe like a uh, thousand brains. Yeah, so you can then query like the web, come up with some, some context like this context could be like oh Jeff Hawking is uh renowned blah 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 and the other context is that uh thousand brains is by Numenta you know something like that so this can then condition to say that oh the author is Jeff Hawking okay. so if you don't do retrieval augmented generation you don't search the web for more details okay you may not get you may not get the answer that is as consistent as what you see here. So if you can do something to ground your context by using external APIs to, to draw the web and get some answers to like to serve as conditioning to your prompt, this will greatly help the reliability of the large language models output. Okay, so something like this, this is quite important. Next, we can also add in phrases, all right, to ask it to generate things in a very consistent way. So if this is a bit of a hack. You can just say X represents content X that the LM should replicate exactly. Okay, so uh, if you look at the visual chat GPT prompting, you realize that in order to get the file names to be consistently accurate, all they did is that they say the file names must be exact. Do not hallucinate file names. Use the exact phrasing. So they, repeat the, they repeated the word, use the exact phrasing about three times in the entire prompt of visual chat GPT. So just asking the large language models to do things exactly can already trigger a sort of uh, process to, to let the LLM fact check itself in some sense. Yeah, can so I add some uh, personal anecdote here? Oh yeah, please go ahead, yeah. Because I've tried, uh, I've tried uh, GPT-4 with the plugin. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I got the access to the beta plugin. Oh, okay. So there, there is one, but it's not the one like the official web search tool. It's some, something that uh, someone created. So mm -hmm. it's not official one, but it still can do the like the uh, retrieval augmented uh, generation because it still can search online. But, but actually I faced some issue there because I tried to, I, I gave it uh, a web page I wanted to summarize. But, but just out of curiosity, right? I didn't ask it to summarize. I need to, to offer exactly the text <laughs> from that website. But you know what? Actually, it cannot do it. It, it gave me like something that looks very similar to 
to the content from that website, but if I do a word by word search, I cannot find exact sentence. So it is still hallucinating. But the interesting thing is, okay, first thing, uh, so my suspicion is that it might have something to do with the, the plugin the person created. I don't know the internal working of that plugin. Maybe uh, they so, never prompted to use uh, the word exactly enough. <laughs> they never put the word exactly. No, I, I, I put it, I, I told it explicitly to give me the exact word, the exact text, they did, but it didn't. And so I, so after the, after maybe like when they released the, the official uh, web search tool, we'll, we can try again. But I tried to compare with Bing, the Bing search to give it the same white page to exactly the same prompt to like to ask it to give me the exact text. Actually, Bing can Bing can do it. So that's quite strange. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe so the way there might be a uh, can be a some uh, yeah can be a lot of things like going on like under the hood. I'm not sure why, but yeah, just to share my personal experience with the plugin. Yeah. Thanks. Um, then that it might be a case of um, the prompting for the plugins might be might not be the best or it may not have like some, you know, sometimes when you do like question answer with a PDF document you may not get the full chunk of text they might actually break it off like in chunks of 500 tokens or so on and so the like when it comes to generating back exactly you know if the LM sees like for example this sentence here x represent content x if the LM is only given stuff like this, represents contact X, that, uh, and then the LM is given another chunk, should replicate. Uh, then, you know, if, if, if you are not given the entire document to begin with, because you are given chunks of it, then what you have to do, you have to fill in the gaps. Huh? <laughs> so that's why maybe you get output that is not exact. Maybe because the context token length is not sufficient to cover the entire document. No, but, but I asked it to give me the exact words from a certain subsection. So the which I think the content lens is sufficient to cover that subsection, but I still cannot do it. Oh, it just keep insisting on hallucinating. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. We can try it out now. Like, you can ask the large language model. Let, let's just try it out now. Okay, let's, let me just uh, go to... We can ask the large language model to, to output something in, in a very, very fixed context. Okay, let me just... Uh, Load, load up my web page. So let's see, share screen. Okay, so let me just go to a new chat. Let's just use GPT-4, okay, just because it's like a more later one. So um, here we can ask it to say, repeat the following exactly. Yeah, so you know, so far it looks like it can do it. All right, let's just try a very, very long sum of text. Maybe I'll just use the one that I, I was doing for my evolution game. Like the evolution game I was just creating this uh, recently is about um a bacteria cell evolving in harsh climates. Okay. So that's uh so if you are able to do something like that. We can see that it's able to do the thing like almost word by word. I think it's it's probably word by word. Okay, so if we don't say repeat exactly, you you may you may not be able to like do it exactly like that. Now let's just try to see whether this kind of thing works for uh Chat GPT because it looks like it's working for GPT four. So if we go back to Chat GPT, let's just see whether it can like repeat the whole thing. No, it's not bad. I mean, it looks like it's, it's correct. Yeah. So if, if it's given the contexts that are already like in the right format, I think it's possible to do the, the repeat thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, because being also powered by GPT-4, so I, I, I guess like the chances are is the, the plugin got some issues. Yeah. This is a problem of prompt engineering then. <laughs> Yeah, that's why prompt engineering is such a big thing now. Yeah, people are trying to use large language models to do their stuff. But if you don't prompt it correctly, you're going to have very uh, inconsistent outputs. You're going to have outputs that don't really uh, reflect your intention. So, I mean, this, this needs some way of tweaking it. So, yeah, I realized that if you want to get it to do exact stuff, using these quotation marks help a lot. 
somehow maybe because quotation marks tend to be like in in inline citations i guess yeah so if you want to use uh, exact matching use double quotation marks it has worked for me quite well for my games right to replicate exactly i mean it, to make it even clearer you can say that this x represent content x that the lm should replicate exactly so if you say something like that this like is like re reinforcing the use of this quotation marks so again um if you want the large language model to like generate things of a certain format or if you want it to give clever fill ups of some options, you can give curly brackets like that. And you say that this X represents content X that the LM should provide to the best of its capabilities. So you can ask it to do stuff like later in the game, I ask it to generate different options for the lawyer. So your bracket here can be like the options. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. This is very versatile. I tried it in various contexts and you can ask it to generate a lot of things. But you just need to say like, you can say things that are sweet list three things that are sweet then you put the curly brackets or then the three things will come out yeah that's pretty interesting all right so the last thing i'm talking about before i show the lawyer game example i think this is the last oh sorry this is the second last thing all right it's about memory so the memory part is interesting for a large language model because if you generate something that's too long right you might get out of context length so the context length for chat gpt is eight thousand tokens and for gpt4 is 32,000 tokens so if you want it in a single session, okay, to use the things that are similar, uh, sorry, if, to, to know things that are like in a single session, you want it to retain important things. You kind of need to repeat and repeat the, uh, the important context again and again so that ChatGPT would still retain this information. So one way of solving this in the future will be to link with some external memory API. And then you can use this API to to gain back like the knowledge that the GPT should have. So until now, this is like a, a hack. Okay, until we can interface with some memory API to store important memory for the LM to know at every prompt generation, you can give it stuff like that. Before every output, you have to provide the following information. So you can say stuff one, stuff two, you can even ask it to describe a series of important stuff. So I'll show you the practical example later. So you will see this in the lawyer game. Okay, so this is another interesting thing that I found out. Um, this is about sequential prompting. All right, apparently, if you can prompt the large language model in a sequence such that the earlier questions will help to reinforce the output for the later questions, you can get more accurate generation. So like, for example, you can ask it to give a broad plan of the day, okay, before asking it to give the detailed plan, which is like the, the detailed timeline. So one way of doing this is like this. Like for example, you want to buy bread for breakfast. So again, we are doing an intent planning. We ask it to be a day-to-day -day activity planner. These are the requirements. Buy bread, have time for breakfast, lunch, dinner, have a one-hour game session, three-hour group discussion with students, two-hour lecture on large language models and prompting. Okay, and then you have some constraints you want to like ground it in. Uh, awake only from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Okay, this is the interesting part. This is where we need to test where they can generate. Like game session is after group discussion. Group discussion is after lecture. Okay, so it means that what I need to do is I need to do the group. I need to do the lecture first. This needs to be number one. Okay, in the sequence of events, this is number one. And then the, lec the group discussion will come next. And the game session will come third. Okay, so you... You can ask it to do some ordering like that using the constraints. Okay, and if you don't do this broad plan, you will see some problems later. So now let's see what it generates for the broad plan. The broad plan in general fulfills this, okay, lecture, all right, free discussion, games. Okay, so in general, it does that well. And then it has lunch breaks at uh, quite good timings, I would say. Lunch breaks and like breakfast at good timings as well. So this is not too bad. And then condition on the broad plan, you see that it actually can give you the timings according to the broad plan, which is quite cool because then you can say that, oh, uh, what are the specific stuff like head to the store? I mean, can prompt it even more specific stuff, but here's just an illustration that you can ground it on the broad stuff, then do the detailed stuff. Okay, if we had started off asking to do the detailed plan straight away, this is like what may happen, right? See, they ask you to do the group discussion first. 
okay, which is wrong, okay, because in the constraints, we want to do the lecture first, then the group discussion. So if we have started with the detailed stuff, we may not be getting the output that we actually want to get. So planning it in terms of a broad plan followed by a detailed plan is actually a very powerful technique for large language models. Uh, I am using such a technique to solve the ARC challenge. Yeah, I don't mind sharing this. Again, I've shared in previous videos as well. Because this is a way to do conditional generation. You ask the large language model to come out with like a broad plan first, a broad series of steps to reach the goal. Then you ask the large language model to based on this plan, generate the specific steps needed. It is a very powerful technique. It works quite well. Okay, so yeah, this is, uh, if anything you want to take away from today, I think this is one of the most important. <laughs> okay, before I move on to the, this is the last part, the law game. Any questions you all have or anything you want to share about your own experience with ChatGPT as well that I haven't covered? Okay, if not, I will do the last part, the COD simulator game. So this is the last part, very fast. All right, and this game is basically like you are a lawyer and you are trying to make the case for one part of the judge. So it's either the prosecutor or the defendant. And over here, you see, I use the same technique. The language model is now a cloud simulator named Jarvis. <laughs> the player is you, All right? And then this is the format, speaker's name, dialogue. So again, curly brackets give you format. This represents content that you need to create. Okay, this represents content that should be preserved. And then we have an introduction, okay? And then you can just say the introduction is this, this is what you should do, this is what you should do. And then over here, we have, again, the format, like this is the description. And then in the curly brackets, like what are the descriptions? You can even make very specific stuff like, oh, this is uh, not including witness for, for the evidence and so on. So it's quite powerful, this curly brackets thing. All right, next, the introduction screen. Okay, actually, this is the same slide as before, so uh, I will not cover this. All right, the phase description of the game. You can also say that, oh, there are different phases of the game that you need to take into account. These are the different phases. Okay, and yeah, um, this is like how we prompt the LM to know like what to do next. So you give it the list of sequence, and then at the end of it, okay, once it reaches this last part, it will end the game. So one thing to note here is that for the witness phase, okay, is actually like prompted differently, like one side examine and the other side cross-examine. Okay, the same thing here, one side evidence, the other side for evidence. Yeah, so I try to keep this as similar as possible. <laughs> yeah, but the witness one involves asking questions. So I had to use ways of uh, getting the witness to, to like prompt the question in the prompt itself, right? Because if not, it will just be treating it as present the evidence. Okay, so like this is the, like how you should do for the phases, like at the start of each phase, show this. Current phase is what? Ah, remaining phases is what? So this is actually the memory. So I ask it to give me the memory of all the remaining phases. And I ask for a separate phase for each witness. Okay, this is because um, this will serve as like the memory of like what are the remaining phases. So as we finish one phase, these remaining phases will be uh, re re reduced by one and so on until we finish. And the witnesses are separate phases because the witnesses typically take a long time for the questions to be asked. And by then, you know, the memory might be needing a quick refresh again. So that's why the phases are separate for witnesses. Okay, the AI judge will basically say what the phase is about and then after that, the AI judge will be the, the one to like prompt the player from the other side, from the player from the other side. And all these are specified by prompts. And then this is the input for the player. So input required, okay. So I specify here, please ask questions for witness so as to condition what are the things that you can uh, output. And this is the interesting part. You can even ask GPT to generate the broad intent for you to consider. So the broad intent can be like, uh, like, what are the suitable broad intents, okay, for different causes of actions according to judge's request. So you can see that this judge request comes first before the player prompt. So whatever you see from this player can be conditioned on the judge's request. Okay, so this is again where the order matters. 
and then I use the different block intents because you can get like one, two, or three from the output. So this um basically helps the player decide because sometimes people don't want to type out the entire text on their own. So you can do one, two, or three. So yeah, the response will be made into dialogue form. Again, this is prompting GPT, okay, to create things in dialogue form. So I use a lot of conditioning here, right? The response will be followed by either response of AI judge or AI witness so that the game can continue. Because after the AI judge take over, he will prompt someone else. After the witness response, okay, the AI judge will then prompt the game someone else. So this is just to uh, make the game flow. All right. So you notice that all this are uh, in this um brackets. Okay, and I realized that um this normally can hold for the first generation of the input prompt. But after that, you know, as we slowly play the game, this might be forgotten. Okay, because this initial prompt will be forgotten after enough conversation has happened. So yeah, this is something that unfortunately is not able to be done really well right now with just this method. But um, if we were to use this uh, with the game right now, it can play quite a plausible game. But of course, the improvements of this game will be you need to use a separate LM for each agent. For each judge, uh, for each judge, uh, lawyer, witness. Okay, so, so each has separate memories. Okay, this, this is something that can be done. You also can have a LM or rules-based program to determine the sequence of the game. Okay, because this is something that the large language model doesn't do too well in right now. Okay, so it's trying to do all this in one, and that's why this prompt is quite difficult to create. But in the future, if you have separate large language model systems for each of the agents and a, a rules-based program okay, to do the logic required, this can actually be very powerful. All right. If not, actually, that's the end uh, for today's uh, stuff on prop engineering. Yep. So, yeah. Any last things before I end the session? Okay. If not, thanks for coming. And yeah, see ya.